your work in Barbados as well as some of his earlier work had, I'm going to say, found very good evidence that he was collecting cosmic materials. And, you know, now we look back and say that wasn't cosmic material, but it was, it was highly, it wasn't just like a pie in the sky, it was, it was very good evidence. Incredible. Very credible. And NASA, don't forget, this was at the very beginning of <coughs> the space age, six years after Sputnik, when the NASA was ramping up and all this was stuff, there was money available. So Dave got a position at the University of California. His, not his boss, but the group, head group there, the head of the group was Harold Urey, Nobel laureate and a very uh, big person in the U.S. Uh, cosmogenic uh, field of cosmology and whatever. And Jim Arnold, who later became the chairman of the lunar sample allocation, who was in charge of doling out lunar samples. So these are fairly high level uh, space scientists back in the mid 60s. And Jim's idea was to fly a balloon in the low stratosphere, 100,000 feet up. And it would do the same thing that Dave's meshes were doing out here. In fact, it, I worked on that program for a year after I went to California. And it, too, was very promising. It didn't turn out. <laughs> I mean, it didn't produce as a byproduct the terrestrial mineral aerosol. This project did. So getting back now, getting back to the history, we cut the Dave's out here. <coughs> Living in Codrington College, has a little lab there, contacted Judge Taylor, this figure out a good place, and you saw my one slide this morning where he had, a, had like a sail about 10 square meters or 5 square meters, and he processed that at Codrington College and got promising results. We learned with, his, with the money, with the NASA grants and all that sort of stuff, uh, Claire and I came out here to join Dave in early 65, in May of 60, no, sorry, March of 65, and we landed in Barbados in the 12th, I think, of March, and set to work. Okay, the first thing we had to do then, oh, prior to that time, Dave had contacted around, so he's based in Codrington College, and I'm not quite certain, but how he made the connection to the Lodge school people, but he did contact uh, Dave Clark, who was, the, who was the physics teacher. And I'm not quite certain how it became Messiah Street, but don't forget, Messiah Street is between Dave, Lodge, Dave Clark's house and Lodge School, and it's also near Codrington College, and probably all that happened was that <coughs> they found out that there was a house available that could be rented for a couple of years and that the, 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 the lady who owned it was not averse to having it used for this thing. So when we, Claire and I, came out here, then that was where we lived. And in that house, the front bedroom basically became the, the laboratory. It was, it was a fairly decent sized room about from there to there to here. And that was the outer, <coughs> that was clean, but not a clean room. Inside there, we erected a, a laminar flow polythene sheet uh, clean room, and it didn't have didn't have good air exchange, so you could only work in it. This is this is a fairly high quality of clean room if you if you don't want to stay in it for a long time. So you go in. Oh, you, you, before you go in, you take a shower. You go in, in your underwear and a shower cap. You work for maybe three quarters of an hour. laboratory had an air conditioner, one of the not exactly rare air conditioners, but certainly not, not common throughout the, uh, throughout particularly in Messiah Street. And in the outer clean room then we had the microscopes and whatever, and we had a fairly sophisticated array of, I'm going to call it particle measurement systems. So we had uh, high powered microscopes with oil immersion lenses if necessary, binocular microscopes for manipulation of small particles. We had the refractive index systems, specific gravity systems, magnetic susceptibility, oil immersion lenses for doing size distribution, and a panoply of, uh, shall we say, just standard laboratory sort of equipment. So even though we were moderately, uh, what should we say, pre
primitive. Yeah, <laughs> we, we we were not uh, we were not really primitive. We had we had we had the, the sort of things you need for doing particle work down to micron sized particles. And don't forget now we're collecting a hundred. No, not a hundred. We're collecting a million cubic meters of air, the material out of a hundred cubic meters of air, at about 50% efficiency. The efficiency falls off below five microns, but even at one micron, it's still 20% efficient. So we were looking for cosmic material between 10 and 100 microns. This is this was the window that Erpik and Whipple and things had said that we should we should examine. So we were we were doing the right sort of stuff. During the course of running this experiment, it took us, what should we say, well, April, May, June, July, into August, four months, to put out the foundations. Sunny, oh, Winston built the wooden platform. We built the foundations. Sunny's crew came out, put the platform on the foundations, put in these utility poles. You can still see there are tropical hardwood poles about this big around. They're cemented in and guide, and then the platform, which is made out of wood, no iron in it, no no nails, no steel nails, mostly dovetailed construction, quite quite a nice piece of work. And wherever it was absolutely necessary for metal, like some nails, they were phosphorized. So you know, it is fairly complicated system. This was on these four poles sitting on the thing, four poles through it, and then you saw in the picture this morning, the whole thing was winched up 25 feet up onto the poles and then secured. We then built the, the goal post, the superstructure. And don't forget, this thing was, if this is the cliff, this thing was built here overhanging like that. And that, that, was the, that was the fate of this thing because seven years later, the cliff collapsed front end of the tower fell in the, into the sea and, and they had to chainsaw off the things to keep it from, from being a public nuisance. But the tower did its job. I mean, it, it, it functioned for the period. We only wanted it to last for two years and Joe extended it for another six years or something. We had two local young guys, uh, James Jordan and Colin Blackman from Messiah Street to what should we say? Once we had the, the whole process set up, and James and Colin twice a day would come to our place, uh, shower, clean it, get into these clean sort of outfits, get all of the stuff ready, motorcycle out to the tower, take off their shoes, wash their feet, climb up the tower. I mean, it was it was like a everything. Oh, this is these were the procedures that Dave and Claire and I had worked out in the first place so that you were you had almost like a, a pantomime so that you didn't have any inadvertent uh, difference from one period to the other. That, that's the way that you do blanks and controls in, in scientific work is you do exactly the same thing and the, the blank is one of these meshes that goes through the whole process gets hoisted up on its thing but then instead of having a 24 hour exposure, it has a uh, three minute exposure and then it comes back. So it has all of the handling stuff but doesn't have the exposure. So each day then these things were washed and the sticky agent on the on the on the impact is which are the, the fibers of the mesh on the on the on this actually it's monofilament nylon bolting material, which is the stuff they use in flour mills. They grind up the wheat and then they put it through a sieve. These sieves are a little, little bit like mosquito netting, but, but, but nicer. So that material then would go back and be washed off into these buckets. The buckets would then be transferred, the slurry as it were, would be transferred to glass jars into the, onto the back of the motorcycle. They'd come back, they go through a standard procedure in the laboratory, and each time we got, we processed them, we made the subtle changes to reduce the background. In the end, the after something like a month or so of working on these things, we, we, we actually knew that some of the stuff that we had, like uh, the waxy lumps, the uh, cokey balls, the diatom shells, the vegetative material, the fungus hyphae, 
quite a few other things, biggish particles, were in fact, they came from somewhere else. They, they were not from handling process, they went from Barbados. That left then this mineral, fine mineral material, and we were collecting something of order of 10 grams a day, which is 10 micrograms <laughs> per cubic meter, which is sort of about in the right, that's the right range, isn't it? Yeah, that's what Joe's collecting out here now. So being, I'm going to say, being, a, being good scientists, we did the right thing. What we did is we didn't know what the hell it was, but we collected it, measured it, and, and basically set it aside while we did some other things. Then we came back and tried to figure out what this stuff was. Now Dave had never worried about it. He just thought it was local stuff from the reef or something. But what we did is we did some fairly simple gravimetric analysis. If it was local material, it would have high calcite. So we looked for calcite in it, and we looked for we did a simple gravimetric analysis, and we were dealing with gram quality and quantity. So you know, on the back step of the house in Messiah Street, did gravimetric analysis. Any chemist can do that sort of stuff. Then we took the particles and in this stuff and did a size distribution analysis, stripped off the coat, which we found was mainly iron oxide, did another size distribution analysis. We're fairly convinced now that it was not local reef material. Several of the other things we looked at, just I didn't mention this morning, but we went up to Scotland and looked at the water that flows off into the little you know, the little rivers out there, Joe's River? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, possibly some had come out. We took reef samples out here. Even we got some Orinoco River water. It comes out of like Venezuela. Some of the people that we met were, uh, were shipping people. And so I asked them if they could bring me back some Orinoco water. I think it might have been river water. That was, that was an idea that most of the stuff in the open ocean into the oceans by rivers, the Amazon and whatever. Amazon was maybe too far away, but the Orinoco's well, is around the corner, but it is. So we looked at that stuff, that didn't match, it didn't do the size. And really, we, by something like, oh, I don't know, October of 65, we were convinced that it was African material. Maybe not African, transatlantic material. So the next time that Dave came back from his balloon project, when he went back to the University of California, then he took with him some of this stuff, and now Ed Goldberg and Ryman and, and some, most we say, crackerjack geoscientists and in La Jolla then will get a chance to analyze this stuff. And they then uh, said, yeah, sure, it, that's the only place it can be. I mean, there's all sorts of reasons why it is. I mean, a really, a really good giveaway is that you, you can find the, the remnants of freshwater diatoms. Now, if you find a Globigerina, which is a diatom that lives in the ocean, you say, of course it comes off the sea surface. To find a freshwater diatom shell, not, not the whole thing, it has to come from a freshwater deposit. And in fact, in the last, I don't know, 20 years or 30 years, this has been more or less determined that it comes from uh, ice age lakes in North Africa. this stuff away and it wasn't really until like sort of October of 65, maybe November, that we were pretty, that we were certain and it wasn't until the next year that we were absolutely confirmed. But starting on the 13th of August 1965, we have the collection of mineral dust that came from the mission in Africa. Uh, I don't know, it's true, but Joe probably still has some of those samples. He has a sample. You also look at some samples. I got Anybody the wants to? And since then, Joe has been collecting dust from this system, and it is continuous. Okay, just a, a by the by, when we closed down our project, Dave Parkin and Joe Prospero met almost by accident. Uh, Joe was interested in this sort of stuff, sees the opportunity here, came out here, and we did a like a introduction to what we're doing. Effectively, we handed the program over to Joe. James and Colin worked for Joe. They, Joe continued running the Burbank Tower using that procedure for another five years or so. In the meantime, Joe's idea about the better technique to get down to the submicron particles and all that sort of stuff, and no interest in the cosmic material, he came out to Ragged Point where there was a 
completely a nutshell, but there, there, there are other things. Uh, Dave Clark was involved because he was a physics teacher at, uh, at Lodge. Dave was a, Dave and Jean were good friends of ours for the two years at Clarenheim Stadium. And right now I believe that Dave Clark has died. But if anybody knows where Jean Clark is, anybody, <laughs> we, we would like to make contact with Jean again. And on Monday I'll probably phone up Lodge School and see if I can here and yet despite the fact that I'm sort of a visiting stranger I've always gotten excellent cooperation from from all Bayesians I've always it's always been very gratifying and you know running a station like this is is difficult but other than getting money to run it the work has been done by others and and, and you know we've, we've talked uh, about uh, Cornelia Shea who played a major role and uh, later on, uh, uh, Peter Seeley and Edmund Plays. I mean, those guys, those guys really ran the show, and I couldn't have done it without them. So uh, I don't know if Peter's here. I know Edmund is here, and I really want to, you know, thank them in public to acknowledge the fact that they've done a fantastic job. So, is there, are you here? Where are you, Edmund? Stand up. Peter, is Peter here? Where's Peter? I mean, these guys. You know, and uh, the discussion of the A-gauge work today uh, highlighted the fact that Peter's been working with A-gauge since was 1987, something like that. And that's a very uh, complex, difficult job involving a, a large, large range of uh, instrumentation, which is changing every few years. And yet, you guys have developed a pretty good record. And so, you know, we're very much dependent on, on uh, native Bayesians here, the resident Bayesians, to carry on this work. And you know, we talked about the interaction with the Lodge School, and you know, it strikes me that uh, in the context of STEM activities, I mean, it would seem to me that with the, the Lodge School and other schools as well, but I mean, Lodge is a logical place to start, that you actually could build scientific search, scientific research activities that would be some, in some way related to uh, atmospheric uh, chemistry, radiation, climate, things of that nature. And they could actually make use of these facilities. Uh, we have uh, two laboratories that of our own. And uh, we're certain, shortly, they're going to get another container that could be set up here and could serve just as specifically as their, you know, your own specific CIMH facility. And I, I think that this could be really carried on in the spirit of Lodge and the general participation of uh, the, uh, the people of Barbados in this in this activity. And the people you've often mentioned in the context of asthma, that everyone knows about African dust, but actually I don't think they know a lot of, about African dust. By a lot, I mean, I mean 
great detail, but I mean they're aware of it, but I don't think that, that the general knowledge probably appreciates more specifically what what's involved here, and I think that might be something of an outreach activity that, that could be capitalized on because it's a unique uh, attribute of, of the environment here in, in, um, in Barbados. So, um, you know, we're, it's been especially gratifying to see that now the world, the larger scientific world, is appreciating the unique opportunities here. And now we have uh, our colleagues from, from uh, England uh, with the A-Gage and the various German groups that are working, people working here. And this is a very impressive, very impressive facility that's developing here. And uh, I think it has a long, long way to go. That is, there's much it can it can be carried much further. So, but it's going to fall mostly on your shoulders as as patients and and David, you in particular, as CIMH, to to facilitate that. And and, and, and noting that, I want to comment that you know uh, we've often had good cooperation with the government and citizens of Barbados, but you know, David has done a phenomenal job in carrying on and expanding on these activities in a larger way that is the entire scope of climate and meteorological activities. And I want to acknowledge the fact that he's done such a great job and that I really appreciate it. So with that, uh, I think I will close and thank you all for your participation, and I look forward to seeing you here again 50 years. <laughs>
think uh, probably in a month's time you wrote a concept document, yeah. if I remember. And he said, well, I didn't really get a chance to think about this much. But it was better written, I remember Joe commenting it. Well, I wouldn't want to see what you actually had a chance to really think about something <laughs> because it was a really impressive document. And then he went off to uh, Max Planck because I think yeah. the proposal was never accepted by the yeah. NSF yeah. in the US. And he went off to Max Planck and he negotiated that he should be able to do this yeah. type of work. And so we ended up with the facility over there uh, because of Bjorn's persistence and we agreed that we would partner in maintaining it. And so Marvin, uh, every Tuesday when Marvin disappears from the Institute, this is where he's supposed to be anyways. <laughs> he's supposed to be over here working on the LIDARs. And there's some really impressive technology over there as well. And so, I mean, Marvin has come up here and he's maintained that system. And Bjorn came to me once a couple of years ago and he goes, you know, Marvin's really a genius, you know. We never expected any of this stuff to work and anybody to make it work. <laughs> and uh, I mean, there was the dial that Marvin became really familiar with and kept the dial running for a number of years, which impressed Bjorn, because I think Bjorn was only looking for it to last a, a year at the most. And so there's a, quite a bit of stuff over there. And one of the things that we want to do is uh, kind of foster a stronger rela working relationship between the two facilities and the other facilities around the region to really uh, get things moving. But I haven't forgotten you, Judd, because I remember also the conversation with you. We're going to set this up in the park, get us and, and this type of stuff. we got to cut a hole in, in the roof and all this kind of stuff. And so we've got our LIDARs. Uh, we've got, uh, I think Bjorn has two radars over there now. Uh, so for those of you who want to go over to Bjorn's facility, we can try to facilitate uh, a trip over to Bjorn's facility over there. I can find Marvin and get Marvin to open it up and so on. Uh, okay, good. And so I think that this is really, um, this all started, I mean, 50 years ago, we've got people coming in, we've had uh, Holger and the, uh, the group from Leibniz Institute for Tropospheric Research coming into a really unique experiment a couple of years ago, uh, where they had this sled, off the east coast of Barbados uh, and I guess papers came out of Bruce's oh, work yeah, as well, quite right. a number yeah. of papers came yeah. out of that. Yeah. And then we had uh, Bjorn Stevens brought the, uh, yeah Bjorn, oh hold on a sec, was it? I'm trying to get my flights in order here. <laughs> uh, I can never get my flights in order, I miss flights all the time. But we had also, uh, was it the Falcon that came first? The German? Yeah, the Falcon came first uh, with the Leibniz group again, and so we had a series of flights for two years, I think. The Falcon flew for two years, right? Two missions, uh, one mission. No, one was the Falcon and one was the Falcon. Yeah, well, I'm talking about the Falcon now, and so Falcon flew missions off of our business as well, and so we had uh, a series of papers coming out of that as well, and uh, we had uh, Tropos at CIMH that got me in a lot of trouble. Because we never told the local residents that we were setting up LIDARs at CIMH. And uh, this became a talking point on the talk shows in Barbados. And CIMH should have done better and informed us of what was happening because we were scared to death about the death rays that were coming from outer space. And, our houses. and so we had to apologize about that. And, but, it, but we had to also learn to work with the public, and that was an important thing because it was really cool 
school science because you had the Munich LIDAR and the uh, Leibniz radar crossing each other. I remember the light in between the two of them and so I think there was some, some impressive science that came out of that. And then uh, we had the RNK long that came down in 2013 and uh, again we went to the to civil aviation and civil aviation said yes you can do this and then we went to the airport and the airport said no you cannot do this this is the height of the tourism season and we have no space on our way for you to park that aircraft in our place and uh, so we started looking around the region for places to park the aircraft and uh, then we went back to civil aviation and civil aviation said but we gave you permission you go tell the airport that you have permission to put the plane in Barbados <laughs> and you work and they will work with you on when you can park the aircraft in Barbados. And that was kind of fortuitous because the aircraft would land in Germany for two weeks. <laughs> so if you go about the mission was supposed to go, you're supposed to fly back to Germany and come back the next day and this type of stuff. And so Bjorn said, but then we can't go back now to Germany because of the weather in Germany. And so I went back to civil aviation and civil aviation said, ah, you can park the aircraft in Barbados, be off the ground at the at the height of aircraft arrivals in the afternoon, be out somewhere in the ocean and land the plane after all the aircraft have left. And so <laughs> so we did this for two weeks and I guess uh, whoever provides fuel at the airport actually made a lot of money because they were fueling up every day in Barbados and so on. And so I think that, that uh, and I know Bjorn is talking about another trip down here, uh, Falcon flights coming again uh, in 2016 and so on. And so it would be really interesting, and I can say this to DLR now, if a CIMH person can get on the aircraft for one part of the mission. I'm going to go on. I, 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 <laughs> 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 but I think it would be really good for science here if we could have somebody participate in uh, some, in some way, shape, or form fashion. on a helicopter the other day with the door open and the pilot banked and said, so you can get all the pictures you want. And I was okay the other way around. <laughs> so, but it's, but there's been a lot of stuff that has come out of here. I mean, I've, I've met the A-gauge people and we looked at the A-gauge data and we're not curious about looking at the A-gauge data and really doing something with it. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity as we look forward to working with the entire scientific community uh, with this whole and that was very science and kind of molding the next generation of uh, Caribbean scientists that uh, there is good opportunity and there's a lot of excitement in this, in this particular field and it's something to I mean, I'm, I'm the one person that I don't skip here that I would like to really thank for the introduction is Margaret Margaret uh, Castaneda Jeffers because Margaret was the one that introduced you and I to each other at CIMH back around 2007 yeah. or so yeah. when you came yeah. by and so I mean it, Margaret was really the catalyst because Margaret was yeah. selling your program to me you know we really should do this we really should get involved in this and I think this would be a really good opportunity so, so I think uh, Margaret really uh, sold this program in terms of getting involved and we should get involved and so on and so I'm not going to keep anybody here any longer but just to say that it's been a really good experience uh, working with all of you I think a lot of our staff have matured working with uh, Damien has matured working with the Leibniz group. Margaret has done wonders working with the Max Planck group. And uh, so okay, we've got strong German connections. I mean, Joe and I, uh, I don't know if you remember Ronald Gordon, but uh, in 2008 or so, I approached Joe with letting a youngster come up to Miami on a student exchange. And uh, when by the end of the student exchange, he was a master's student at the University of Miami, and he did some really, really interesting work at the University of Miami that started us working with other groups in the U.S. to get students uh, brought on as interns. Uh, some of them have gone on as Ashford Reyes, who's been talking in the back quite a bit. Uh, but Ashford started off with Greg Jenkins as a doing some work with Greg Jenkins here, and uh, Greg took him up to the 
the U.S. and some way caught Greg into letting him skip the master's program and going straight into the PhD program. Uh, now he's Dr. Ashford Reyes and so on. So I think that these exchanges have proved extremely useful and hope that they'll continue to prove useful. And uh, Bill, we look forward to working with you on making the this center concept a reality here where we start talking about uh, the Pan American Center for Stand, Stand and uh, Dust Tower for the Morning. I know I got some letters mixed up in their <laughs> system, uh, but really focusing not just collecting data for the sake of collecting data and modeling for the sake of modeling, but really to apply it to health and well being in the region. And so I think that this is really, really important work that we're doing. And so I would like to say to all of you guys, and I don't think that we will ever be, uh, we would ever have the same type of triple point that we had uh, today, uh, where you get people who've done some impressive things over the last 50 years coming by and actually sharing that experience with most of us. I think this is a, a unique opportunity that probably, I don't know, Joe, will probably never happen again. And so I just want to thank you guys who have come and put in the opportunity to spend your own money and invest your own uh, resources into coming here. I just want to thank all of you guys for making this a wonderful thank experience. The RCA, I mean, staff that will hold me to that. <laughs> so, uh, so I just want to thank CIA I mean, staff for coming out. I just want to recognize how the lovely director of Barbados Red Service.